15 men to do the work of the ministry in evangelizing Jewish populations in our own country. Lord, you know where the men are. You know their abilities that you've given them, the gifts they have in the ministry, and so I pray you work on their heart to give them a desire. Thank you for this day, Lord, and for these precious folks who are gathered here. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So remember that. Now, we have the announcement here about the room-to-room -room visitation every week. As you know, Brother Kevin Kaiser uh, has really taken the lead in that ministry, and he goes every week. And in fact, now he's going on more than just Wednesdays. He's going a couple of days a week. We were given an opportunity last week by uh, Crystal Care, the, um, the facility there in Ashland on East Main, we were given the opportunity there to have a visitation ministry at their facility as well. And so I appreciate the open door, and of course we're going to take advantage of that opportunity. And uh, if any of you feel led to help in that ministry, uh, we, sure need, we sure need help. And I uh, wish you'd come and speak to me about it. All right, let's get to the scripture now for just a few moments. And turn to Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. We've got a lot of sick folks in our church and a lot here out this morning of Brother Ken Roberts, the surgery he had on Friday, the report I received, but that turned out well and uh, it was a success with that type of surgery. A lot of the results are not going to be coming in for a few more days yet. So we thank the Lord for that. Um, the Heinzes, of course we know what Sister Roseanne is going through and I ask you to remember them in prayer. And uh, pray for Jessica, too, if you will. She's, um, whatever this is going around, the, the children had it, and we thought everybody was over it. But then this morning, she, uh, she's come down with it herself. <clears throat> so, it's been an interesting week. We, a um, member of our family, I say this with a heavy heart, a member of our family was on the breakfast table this morning. <laughs> And so, those of you inquiring about how Penelope is doing, <laughs> she was excellent. <laughs> we, had to, we had to have her, well, we won't go any further than that. How did Abby take that? Abby said, uh, Abby said, Daddy, you're not going to kill the pig, are you? <clears throat> and I thought about this. You, you ever pray for the Lord to give you wisdom right on the spot, you know, <laughs> on how to answer a question? So I thought about it and I said, yeah, <laughs> we, we are. What can you say? The pig's on vacation. She'll be coming back, you know, after a few days. Now, I did say this, and it wasn't a lie. I did say, Abby, honey, you'll see her again. <laughs> she did. She did. On a biscuit about that. <laughs> Amen. All right. Oh, incidentally, I'll be selling sausage in the back after the service this morning. All right, let's uh, get to the scripture now. Jeremiah chapter 8 uh, and verse 20. This is one of the most solemn verses in all scripture. It has quite a message to it. And it's a message really of despair, almost a message of hopelessness. But if you'll take it and let the Lord use it as a warning, this passage can be a real blessing to you. Jeremiah chapter 8, find verse number 20. You know the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations, you'll know that because of the sin of God's people, God was forced to move in judgment. God is a good father, by the way. And he not only sends blessings, but he also chastises at times. Any good parent knows that chastisement is necessary. God, being a good father, knows how necessary chastisement is. But he's very long-suffering with us. Here he had warned Israel through many prophets over many years that their ways were displeasing him and if they continued on that path, he was going to have to judge them. But they brushed his warnings aside as men still do today and God had to move in judgment and you know how that went? Invading countries came in and carried the Jews away on more than one occasion. And in Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 20, after this great uh, defeat had come and the strongest men of the kingdom had been carried away to serve in a strange land. Israel had been decimated and still more judgment to come. The prophet makes this statement. 
chapter 8, verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Isn't that a solemn passage? He's saying our opportunities are gone. He said the summer is ended, the harvest is past, and yet we're not saved. There's a note of finality about that. Judgment had come for these people, and they knew that their time had run out. Now this morning I want to talk to you about judgment for a moment. God is a God of judgment. If you read through the Old Testament and the New Testament alike, you'll, you'll see that word judgment come up. As best I can tell, it comes up about over 2,000 times in Scripture, judgment. Either the word itself or a reference to it. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18 says, Our God is a God of judgment. Well, let's talk about judgment. How many times have you tried to help somebody and, and with a good heart and right motive and they come back with this, Don't judge me. Or they'll quote to you Matthew 7. You ever anybody quote that? Yeah. Judge not lest you be judged. Right. That's a defense people throw up when they don't want to hear what God has to say about it. Right. However, they don't go on and read the next verse and the verse after that. That passage is teaching that we ought not judge according to hypocrisy like the Pharisees were doing it. The Pharisees were judging folks for doing the same things they were doing behind closed doors. That's what's meant in that passage. But if you take the scripture all together, the scripture teaches that we are to judge righteously. And he that is spiritual judges all things. Everybody in this house made a judgment this morning. You made several before you even got to church. You made a judgment on what you're going to wear. You made a judgment on, you're going to make a judgment on what you do after you leave here. What, what, what are you going to have to eat and what pew you're going to sit in and all that. We make judgments all the time. But when you talk about God as the judge, that's when folks start to get a little uneasy and a little nervous. I haven't brought a message like this in a while and it's probably been too long. These things are necessary. So just for a little while, I want to talk to you about the two different kinds of judgment in Scripture. And God is very narrow here, and when He judges, He gives you the standard by which He judges. If you're sitting in heaven, and from God's perspective, He sees the whole world in one of two categories, either the saved or lost. He doesn't really see them nations or colors or nationalities or income brackets or education levels. When He looks at a man, that man is either one of His children or one of the devil's children, it's just that way. There's no middle ground. And so, we're going to look at the judgment upon a sinner, and then the judgment upon the servant. And everybody in here is going to have to take part in one of those judgments, and if you're here and you're saved, you've had a part in both of those judgments. Although you may not realize it yet. You realize if you're here this morning and you're saved, you have already been judged as a sinner? Amen. You may be thinking, uh, I don't remember that. Well, when Christ died on Calvary, God put all of your sin on Christ. And when God the Father smote Christ with all of his wrath and fury against sin, your sin was judged if you trusted him as your Savior. Yeah. That judgment is passed. How many of you are thankful you never have to be judged by God as a sinner? Yeah. That's the biggest blessing you're going to get all day, folks. I'll never stand before God as a sinner clothed in the rags of my own righteousness. That day's never going to come for me. Some folks say that's a very arrogant statement. They don't believe you can really know for sure where you're going until you die. You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. I'm never going to have to stand before the Lord as a sinner. You know why? Because His Son stood in my place. And Christ not only died for me, He died as me. You think about that. You deserve to hang there and die. Amen. And so did I. Our sin had dictated because the wages of sin is death. And so I've already been judged as a sinner. I let Christ take that judgment for me. But there is a judgment coming for me. I will be judged someday, not as a sinner, but as a servant. And so I want to look at those both quickly this morning. First of all, Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 20. Here's the judgment of God upon the sinner. I can't look into the hearts of everyone here this morning, 
you tell me you're saved, I'm going to just uh, take your word for it that you wouldn't lie about it. But maybe you're not saved. Maybe you've gone through the motions. Maybe you've played the church game and you know the words of the songs and you know how you're to act and you know where all the books of the Bible are and all that. But maybe there's never been a time you personally have been born again. If you die the way you are now, you're going to face this judgment as a sinner. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 11. This is what's commonly referred to as the great white throne judgment. And the scripture says here in Revelation 20 verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. That's coming for the sinner. Did you notice how the Lord referred to these sinners here? He just referred to them as the dead. Now we stood at a graveside yesterday and I read a passage that's a comforting passage if you know the Lord is your Savior. And in that passage, Paul did not reference the dead. He talked about the rapture. He didn't use the word dead. He used the word sleep. And they which sleep in Jesus. You know in scripture when the Lord refers to the death of a saved man or woman, he just calls it sleep. But for the sinner, the Lord just says the dead. There's a great message there, folks. Amen. When you go to sleep, don't you expect to wake up? Amen. When a Christian goes to sleep, when they die, they're anticipating a waking up. And brother, you talk about an alarm clock and missing a time change. You're not going to miss that alarm. When the trump of God sounds, there'll be no mistake, no mistake in it. And what we just read here is a solemn passage. We have here before us billions, billions of souls are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Can you imagine what that scene must be like? Can you imagine seeing those billions of souls come before the great white throne and one by one God deals with them, each one personally? Can you imagine such a thing? How many of you have ever been to a court proceeding and you've watched a court proceeding? I've been to several and it's always something when they bring the defendant in to stand before the judge. I don't care how big and bad the man is, the defendant is, when they stand before the judge and he's elevated there on the bench and he has his robes on and that solemn look on his face, there's always that nervousness in the pit of the stomach. You can see it on their faces as they stand there before him. That's just a mortal man. Imagine what it must be like to stand before a God who's, according to this passage we just read, his power is so great and he has such authority that even the heaven and the earth fled away. You imagine standing before him? Now that's one judge you don't want to find yourself before if you're a sinner. So the last place you want to be, folks, is in the presence of a perfect God if you haven't dealt with your sins. Now that's the first type of judgment. I'm going to give you a few things about this judgment. Number one, this judgment has Jesus Christ as the standard. Do you know every courthouse in this world is supposed to have a standard of judgment? In other words, in our country, the standard of judgment is supposed to be the Constitution. Yeah. How many of you have known that's almost a farce now, but that's what it's supposed to be. The standard of judgment in our country is supposed to be the Constitution. And the job of the justice is to look at the Constitution and determine the, this is a bad word, original intent. Right. Amen. So what's the standard of judgment in God's courtroom? What will he judge men by? What is his standard? It's not the U.S. Constitution. 
It's not the Magna Carta that was signed in England. It's not the international trade agreement. It, it's, it's no laws made by man at all. The standard of God's judgment is a person. And I want you to look at it with me. Turn to Acts chapter 17. This is really the heart of my message this morning because this standard of judgment applies to both the sinner and the servant. If you're smart and you're going to court and you're going to stand before a judge, wouldn't it be to your advantage to know the standard of judgment? I mean, it'd, it'd be very helpful to know what criteria you're going to be judged on. And you better pray you meet that criteria. So the Lord tells us in Acts chapter 17 through the mouth of the Apostle Paul what God is going to use as his standard of judgment. Now, does everybody understand what I'm meaning here? Standard of judgment means when you stand before the judge, he's going to take his standard and line you up next to that standard. And the question is, how do you compare to his standard? That's what a standard of judgment is, folks. How you stack up according to the standard of judgment. The standard of judgment in Acts 17.31, look at what the scripture teaches here. Don't forget it. 1731, because he, he's speaking about God here, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, notice, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Paul says the standard of God's judgment is Jesus Christ. So the question is going to be for the sinner when they stand before God, how do you compare to Jesus Christ? Amen. That's the standard of judgment. And unless the sinner can beat out the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that sinner is lost. Now, how many of you here want to take that?